Right, so it's your average and say it's just this one paper right here. This one paper, you've already got it out. You got what you need. All right, so for everything, if you read it with your partner, you talked about it, and you did a good job that day when I walked around and listened to what you were talking about, you hit all the important things. We're just going over the highlights. And this first paragraph that you want to either with your pencil or ink pen or something marked early aborigines and nomadic. And when you were in, I think, fourth grade, you studied the Native people of America. You studied the Native Americans. And one of the people that you talked about were the Plains Indians. You guys remember studying them and how they followed the buffalo and they would move behind the buffalo herd? That's nomadic. Moving from place to place following food is nomadic. So they were kind of like our Plains Indians where they moved from place to place. That was your early Aborigines. And then you're going to circle that whole second paragraph. So the Aborigines were in Australia doing their thing and then overcome the Europeans, the people from Great Britain. Okay, would you read that entire paragraph for us? Their land was taken over by the new settlers and many of the remaining Aborigines were placed on reservations. We could change this to say Native Americans, and it would be about us in the United States. The same things happened here, where the Native American people were here, and then the European sailors came over, they took their land, they had fought battles, they brought diseases with them, and eventually the Native people lost their land and were put on reservations. So this is about Australia and Aborigines, but it's the same thing that happened here with our Native Americans. Which of our themes? Does that paragraph really match with? Which of our connecting themes? Brittany? Yeah, this paragraph is a great example of conflict and change where you had both the Aborigines and the Europeans, the British, wanting the land. They fought over it and they had conflict. And there's going to be changes to Aborigines' life as they get their land taken away and get moved to reservations. And the next paragraph, we're going to circle today, modern ways. If I went on a road trip, and I was driving across the state of Montana, and I was in my car going down the interstate, do I expect to look out the window and see a Native American on horseback chasing a buffalo with bow and arrow? No, I do not expect to see that today. Now, if I could time travel, I could go back in time, and I could go back to the 1870s, I would see that. There wouldn't be an interstate there, but I could see the Native people doing their thing. Today, if I go to Montana and I'm driving down the interstate and I get off on one of the exits, and I stop at a fast food place, is there a good chance that someone who waits on me or the person in the drive-thru window might be a Native American? Yes. If I went to a school there, might there be some Native American children in the school or one of the teachers be a Native American? Mm -hmm. Or if I went to the grocery store, one of the grocery store clerks, the checkout lady, might be a Native American. So it's just the same in Australia. You know, back in the past, they had their aboriginal ways. Today, most of them follow modern ways. Things. Some things about their art. Circle didgeridoo. Didgeridoo is their musical instrument. And we're going to watch a video in just a minute that shows you the didgeridoo. And circle Warlpuri. It is a weird name. And next to Warlpuri, write dot art. Warlpuri is their word for what we just call dot art. It uses lines, swirls, circles, and dots to create a picture. So when we're talking about dot art, we're talking about something that looks like this. So you have an image that is created. Let me have back there, use the light for us, the black box. Thank you. So we have an image that's created completely from dots. Oftentimes it has to do with nature. Can you tell there's nature in this picture? What do you see? Yeah, there's some lizards. There's a snake, and this one is a really great example of dot art because it's got the dots, it has the swirls, it has the lines, it kind of has all the elements in it. Now, I don't know what the problem is here because on my screen, I can see where the picture should be. You see my little picture here? But it's not showing up there. So 
I have two more examples, but they're not going to show up. Let me Google right quick and just do our dot art. So I'm not sure why these are on my screen on the side, but not showing up up there. So let's look up. A few more examples. Like the dot art, if you go and get and go and Google Aboriginal dot art, you can see all sorts of examples. It's kind of cool, it has what in it. Yeah, it's got Uru, you've got the kangaroos in front of it, you've got air That's kind of a really cool example of dot art. Uh, many, many it depends on how skilled they are, I guess. Like if it was me doing it, I've never done dot art before, I think that would take me a very, very long time. If I was an artist who did it every single day, probably not as long. I don't know if they would classify as abstract or not. Probably because although you got a lizard that's clearly a lizard here. So I'm not sure. It kind of blurs that line. The ones that were just dots and lines, I think, would be abstract. But I would have to look it up, the definition of abstract with this one. Because it's clearly a lizard. And it's clearly a thing. And then when we looked at it a second ago, it was clearly Ayers Rock. It was just made with dots. But the ones that are just random dots and swirls, yeah, I would think that would be abstract. This one, though, clearly has those creatures to it. Anyway, I want to listen to the didgeridoo and learn a little bit more about it. In Australian Aborigine, the earth is an ancient gift. In a time called the Dreaming, ancestor spirits bequeath the land to humans. To this day, Aborigines continue to pay homage to their inheritance through art, stories, dance, ceremony, and song. Reverence and respect to the stories, to be a father of the story, to be in touch with the land. Ceremonies are often secret and separated between men's business and women's business. It is almost impossible for outsiders to know these secrets, but they are the foundation of more than 300 different tribal nations that make up Australia's Aboriginal population today. At the center of Aboriginal music is the didgeridoo. To a lot of people, it's just a piece of wood, but um, a lot of people don't realize it's one of the most ancient instruments in the world. Made from a hollowed out tree branch, the instrument is very hard to play. But Arthur Turtle Tamboy has mastered it. Then how do you keep that wind up? Will it move? Will it, will it fill that mouth up when you blow through? You know, the through the nose. And there's a pressure in the, the mouth. Playing requires good air control between the nose and mouth called circular breathing. The didgeridoo originated in northeastern Australia. Its haunting sound is one of the most identifiable features of Aboriginal culture. But to Aborigines like Turtle, the didgeridoo is more than a musical instrument. It's a portal connecting their land and their spirit. The sound of the planet's spinning is the sound of the spirit. Aboriginal respect and connection with music, ceremony, and land has sustained one of the world's oldest surviving cultures. This hat has some dot art. Um, were there any keys? If you play a, a musical instrument, were there any keys or were there any holes on the didgeridoo? No, the original ones were just hollowed out tree limbs or hollowed out logs. And the difference in the sound is the difference in the breathing that they're doing. 
and it, you know it takes some practice to be able to do that. There's the one shot where it shows the guy standing on the bridge, and that's Sydney Harbour Bridge. Remember, we talked about there's the landmarks that you should recognize as Australia. You can climb that. There's like a walking path that goes across the top. So that was where he was standing at up here. What's this in front of it? Yeah, so Sydney Opera House. Both of these structures are landmarks, like our Statue of Liberty is a landmark that you recognize as America. These are landmarks that you recognize as Australia. All right, going back to our reading, we're going to flip over to the back. In the second paragraph, we're going to circle very strong family ties. Have you guys ever been to a family reunion? Some of you are yes, some of you are no. When you go to a family reunion, if you've ever been to one, a lot of times there's people there that you know. You know, there's aunts, uncles, cousins. But are there are also people there that you don't really know who they are. You just know they're related to you some way, somehow. Have you ever been to one of those reunions where there's a lot of people and there's some people there that I don't know who in the world you are, but you're related to me somehow, some way. A lot of times that's maybe your grandparents' cousins or maybe it's, you know, someone who is like a cousin three times removed. If you've ever looked at charts at how that works as far as like they were a cousin, but there's, there's some generation gaps between you and them. In Aboriginal culture, those would still be counted as close family. So for us here in America, we tend to think of us, our parents, our siblings, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, our grandparents. We usually think of that as kind of our closer family. In Australia, the Aborigines have a little bit broader idea of family. Next to Dreamtime, you want to write stories of creation. And these two paragraphs went into detail about Dreamtime. And they kind of mentioned it in the video as well about the time of the dreaming and how they pay respect to the stories of their ancestors. In the last paragraph, you're going to underline two sentences. Find where it says the spirits taught their ancestors about their tribal lands. And then also where it says it also told them how their descendants should behave. So dream time stories for the Aborigines are their stories of creation, how the world was created. They tell them how they should treat the land and how they should treat each other, how they should behave in their daily life. So it's their, sort of their religion, sort of their religious stories. If you've ever read any of the ancient Greek myths or ancient Roman myths or the Norse myths with Thor and Loki in them, or if you've ever seen anything from ancient Egypt myths, it's the same idea. Those stories that are those teaching stories that t tell how things got created and encourage as far as how people should behave. All right, we're going to write one more note, and then we can put our pencils down for the rest of the class. You want to add the three Ds of Aboriginal culture, just right there below the reading. And it's just a coincidence that these words start with D, but it can help you remember it. When you're studying for the test, you can remember that, okay, for the Aborigines, there's three Ds. There's dream time, there's dot art, there's didgeridoo. Once you've got that written, you can put that paper back in your green folder. We'll be gluing it into our EN tomorrow. And we're going to watch a video that shows a dream time story from Australia. It's a story from the Northern Territory. It's a real dream time story, but they've made it very modern. It kind of looks like a video game animation. In the story, there's two tribes. And I'm just going to use the color of the tribes as a way to describe it because they don't look like people. When you see them, they're weird looking. But there's one tribe that's the brown tribe, and there's another tribe that's the white tribe. When you see the video, you'll see what I mean. And the brown tribe, in their culture, and their group, they have a story that tells them that on the river that they live next to, that there's an area of the river that you're supposed to be extremely quiet, not make any noise, extremely respectful. You stop what you're doing and don't make any sound. 
the Brown tribe has had one of their members captured by the White tribe, and they've went on a rescue mission, and they're being chased by the White tribe. So they have a conflict. They're coming to that point in the river where they're supposed to stop and be silent and not make any sounds, but the White tribe is right behind them. So do they do what their ancestors have taught them they're supposed to do at this point in the river, or do they keep paddling? Because if they don't keep paddling, what's going to happen? They're going to be captured. The white tribe is going to capture their canoe. Yes, sir. Yes, hurry, because we're going to watch your video. There's flashbacks in the story. What's the flashback? Language arts, what's the flashback mean? So it's used a lot of times. It's in your mind, and you're thinking about something that already happened. It's when the author tells you, takes you back in time, and tells you something that happened earlier in the story. So there's a couple of flashbacks in the story. It's what exposition, exposition sometimes is where they're telling you more information. Flashback is just going back in time. So it happened not in the present, but it's something that happened earlier in the story. And you'll notice in this video, there's a couple of flashbacks where they're going to be starting out paddling down the river. But it's going to show you in some flashbacks how they got to that point with their rescue and the other team chasing them. This is called Whirlpool. It's a dream time story. And there's no words. That's why I did a little bit of narrating before we started so that you have a little bit of understanding of what's going on. They look odd. They're not, they don't look like people.
So if you are an Aboriginal child and you are being told this story, how are you supposed to learn from it? What kept them safe? Listening to their ancestors. So that the Brown tribe, you know, they stopped and they did what they had been taught and they were, were kept safe from the monster, that giant enormous snake that came out of the water. And they were also kept safe from the other tribe. So doing what they had been taught, following the teachings of their ancestors, helped protect them. It kept them safe from danger. So you know, the, idea, the moral of the story, the idea that you're getting from it is that you should listen to what your ancestors taught you. The name of the story was Whirlpool. What was the Whirlpool? Yeah, the snake created the whirlpool. The monster created the, the whirlpool. And in many myths from all different parts of the world, there are monsters that are part of those stories. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about, and we're going to do break inside today. We're going to do break in my classroom. So relax a little bit. We're going to watch one more video, talk a little bit about that, and then we'll stop and go get our snacks. We've still got five more minutes of class time, and we're not cleaning until the very end of break, so we don't have to clean. So we've got five more minutes. The last thing we're going to talk about is the stolen generations. You read about this in your textbook when you're doing your notes. And yeah, this was the picture that made a lot of people giggle because the ladies do not have tops. And I think a lot of people notice that part of their culture. Let me show you where this picture comes from. If you look up here, there's it's really nothing humorous about this picture when you read the caption and you realize what's going on. It says, a portrayal titled The Taking of the Children on the 1999 Great Australian Clock, Queen Victoria Building, Sydney, by artist Chris Cook. And when you look at what's going on, these guys are, are taking their children. They're, they're, you know, this part of the still in generation. We talked about when we did our vocabulary word that from the 19... From 1910 to 1970, which is what it said in the book, but it actually started earlier than the 1910s. But from 1910 to 1970, it was a government program that allowed for the taking of Aboriginal children for cultural repro repro reprogramming. They were trying to take away their Aboriginal culture and give them the culture of the European settlers. That picture comes from this. This is the clock. It's a great Australian clock in the Queen Victoria building. And if you look, it's this panel over here. So, you know, definitely not an inappropriate picture. It's in full display in this building in Australia. And it's showing what happened to the Aborigines, which is a really sad story. So, Zai, will you close that door for us? And we're going to listen to an interview with a girl who her grandparents were part of the stolen generation. Her grandparents were two of the children during that time period. One, her grandfather gets taken and her grandmother, they have to hide her to protect her. It's a short video, it's four minutes. After we get through, we'll go and have break. Like many countries formed under colonialism, Australia has a pretty horrible track record of mistreating its indigenous people the Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, many of whom have become known as the Stolen Generation. Why do they call it the Stolen Generation? Because there was a whole generation of kids that was taken from their home. Basically, you either had to be black or white. You couldn't be brown in the middle. So they would consider you in the middle and you would have 
and thank you. Not kidding. Up until 1970s, by law, any indigenous child who looked like he or she had any amount of white ancestry in them could be snatched from their families and forcibly assimilated into white society. My grandfather, my mom's father, he was part of the stolen generation. He was really young, taken out. Oh, okay. he, maybe a year old when he was taken. Oh, wow. So he never knew his real family. He knew because um, when he was taken from the front yard of where they lived. Wait, what? He was in the front yard and somebody just pulled up and took him? Yeah, policemen or rangers would come, pull up, oh. and just grab these half colored kids or colored kids and then chuck them in the truck and then take them. As the little boy was being forced into the back of the truck, his aunt, a young child herself, sacrificed her own freedom so he wouldn't be alone. When she heard the commotion of him crying and screaming, she ran and volunteered and just jumped on. Light-skinned children were often adopted by European families, while darker-skinned children, like Deanne's grandfather, were sent to missionary camps. Most of the missions were based on islands, so and they'd Robert, take you, send you away, let you go out there in a mission and learn about, you know, the Catholic side of it, and on um, the European way, you'd learn English. And then, Try to make you forget your family? Yeah. You never got to see them, right? Yeah, you never ever got to see them. There was no such thing as visiting hours. He spent the rest of it on the island when he was like 18, 19. When he came off, he knew. 18 or 19 years old and basically a prison. Yeah, <laughs> on an island. Just for being born. Yeah, just for being born like. To protect their children, some Aboriginal families resorted to extreme measures using the sap of the milkwood tree. My great grandparents painted my grandmother because she was fairly light. Right. Painted her all black, put stuff on her, hit her in the billabongs, creeks, rivers, and they never found her. So she, they did that so that they wouldn't take her and put her in the schools? Yeah, so the whole stolen, the whole generation that was stolen. Mm. But lucky for the tree and the paint, my grandma was a so, huh. Wow. Deanne's grandmother dyed her skin until her 20s, and she was one of the lucky ones. It's believed that over 50,000 children were stolen between the 1860s and the 1970s, over 100 years later, when the laws were finally changed. But the ones who were taken have suffered ever since. With no identity, family, or bonds, many now suffer from homelessness, alcoholism, and other issues. Thank you for sharing your story. That was really powerful and amazing. And uh, your grandparents sound really wonderful and strong. I don't know how my grandparents would have reacted. Oh, it's good to share. I was just confused by that. It's good to share. Wait, what? What do you think she meant by that? It's good to share. It, it's not a feel-good story. I mean, this is an awful, you know, awful thing that happened in Australia. For over a hundred years, you had children who were taken away from their families. What do you think she meant? It was good to share. What do you think, Gabby? Yeah, for learning purposes. This is a sad part in history. Why don't we just skip it? Why don't we just skip it and not talk about it? What do you think, Brindley? Yeah, we learn about things like this, like the stolen generation, so it doesn't happen again. And to kind of honor what happened to those people, to all those people who were taken. Her grandfather was how old when he was taken? One. And he stayed in that on the island until he was 18 or 19. He was lucky, though. He knew who his family was when he got out of the school. How did he know who his family was? Yeah, his aunt, who was also a child, she went with him. She didn't let him go alone. And to me, that part of the story, can you imagine? She was maybe your age, old enough to know what was going on, knowing that this little boy went, he was never coming back. She went with him. She went to the island, taught him who his family was, and made sure he had a home once he left there. It ended in 1970. In 2008, Australia officially apologized to Aborigines. They established what's called Sorry Day. And in Australia, they honor the fact that there are still in generations. But it was, it was not until 2008 that Australia officially apologized to all the Aborigines. And now, go get your stuff over.